So I don't know if any of you have been following or keep paying attention to this continuing conflict um, in Ukraine. And I, I've been thinking about it this week, and I was reading some information about it this week. My heart is breaking for those people because their infrastructure has been annihilated in much of the country. And here they are. It's freezing cold. It's winter time, And uh, they don't have power. They don't have water a lot of places. They're really struggling, and it's the holidays. And so my heart goes out to them. And as I thought about that and, and just the devastation that they have uh, experienced, uh, if you've been following it, um, Putin, President Putin from Russia, used a strategy in that war called shock and awe. And what that is is at the very beginning, he started at the very beginning, is throw everything that you have, all the power, as much as you have, and just destroy everything that you can and shock people into being in awe of your power and your might so that they are afraid so that they don't they they don't know what to expect they they feel like they're overwhelmed by your power and oftentimes that's effective people will surrender and it's not a new strategy the romans used it centuries ago americans used it in hiroshima and nagasaki that's why we dropped those bombs we used it most recently um in afghanistan and iraq that's shocking just throw as much as you can to shake people up and it's an effective strategy because human beings and even animals are very frightened of things that are stronger and bigger than them especially things they can't control and they don't know where it's going to come from and so if you don't know when this overwhelming power is going to hit you and what it's going to do, uh, that fear of the unknown is very real. But then it triggers that other fear, the fear of pain and suffering and death. It's a very, very effective war strategy because fear is a very effective tool. And we've been talking uh, for the last few weeks about fear and about people who had those kind of normal, understandable fears to us, fear uh, of my limitations or fear of confusion in my life, fear of disappointment. This week, I want to talk about something that doesn't really make sense to us, the fear of God being so shocked and so in awe of God's power that it would be debilitating for us and we would be fearful of just of God himself. And that's a very real fear. We're going to look at a story this week where the shepherds, some shepherds, were just out in their fields and they experienced the glory of God and they were in such shock and awe that they were not just afraid, they were terrified. So let's hear this story. This is from Luke's Gospel. It's familiar. We're going to read from in chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. Let's listen to this part of the story. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But, I bring you, but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. So the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh, holy God, this morning, help us to see your glory. Help us to experience your glory. Speak to our hearts and minds and help us to not be afraid. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's make sure we understand what these... What these shepherds experienced were told that they were out in the fields and an angel appeared to them and they were surrounded by God's glory. 
Just think what that, I don't know about you, I don't know that I've ever seen the fullness of God's glory. They would have gotten the fullness. But I have seen a Sandbridge sunset. Anybody besides me seen a Sandbridge sunset? That to me is the closest that you come to God's glory. Take that and multiply it by a gajillion. It's beyond our imagination. Glory is the ultimate show of power. I looked it up in the dictionary. Splendor, magnificence, majesty. It's the absolute power and presence and splendor of God right in front of them. Wow. Can you imagine? I can't. Must have been awesome. It was so awesome that we're told they were terrified. Now, we've talked a little bit about that, 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 that work, that the Greek word is phobio, and it means to be gripped with fear. We talked about Mary was gripped with fear in her confusion. We talked about the guys on the, ship, on the boat with Jesus when they saw Jesus' power. They were gripped with fear. There's another word added to this, and it's maga phobio, ultimate, maximum, mega fear. Mega terror. They were so gripped, it, it was debilitating. It was the maximum terror you could possibly experience. In the presence of the glory of God. What causes that? What in the world would make us be so shocked by the ultimate power, the ultimate authority, ultimate shock and awe of God's presence that it would debilitate us beyond our imagination? the maximum terror we could experience. I want to offer two reasons that that might happen to us. First of all, we can't control it. We can't control God. And because we don't know what God might do or what God might ask me to do, that scares us. I can tell you, I, I remember taking a group of, of kids from this church to Young Life Camp uh, years ago, and uh, this guy, Chris Buddha, was the speaker, and he put a jail cell. He had a jail cell on the stage, and he spoke from inside the jail cell. And he talked about how we were all living in a jail cell of our own sin and that we were captives to that sin and didn't even know it. And so he challenged all of us to step out of the jail cell and step into life with Jesus Christ. And he, he had like, they were rubber bars and he just opened it and stepped out. And he said, you can do this through the power of God. And I remember having a conversation with one of the girls who said, I, I, I can't do it. I, I don't want to step out of my jail cell. I know my life is messed up. I know I make terrible choices. I know I'm, not, I'm separated from God, but at least I can control this. At least I know how to deal with my own junk. I don't know what God's going to do. I don't know what God's going to ask for me. So I'd rather just stay in the just jail cell where I feel safe. What? But that's a real thing. That's a real thing because we're afraid of God. What, is, what if God makes me do something weird like become a pastor? Or have to give some of my money away? We can't control him, so we're afraid of him. The other thing is... If you see the glory of God, you have to believe in it, right? You can't deny it if you see it and experience it. I love that. I've said it before. I'll date myself. That jo Joan Osborne song, if God had a face, would you want to see it? If seeing meant, then you had to believe. See, here's the thing. If you see the glory of God and you experience the glory of God in your life and around you in the lives of other people, you can't deny it, which means you have to give in to it. And you have to surrender, which means I don't get to be king of my own life anymore or queen of my own life anymore. So we're terrified of God. That's a real thing. Let's admit that to ourselves. It brings fear, the glory of God, this power of God in our lives. But the angel of the Lord said, fear not. I bring you good no news of great joy. You don't need to be afraid of God's glory. See, because the news of God's glory is good news. Let me give you a couple reasons why. First of all, God says that his glory is his goodness. You know, Jesus is wrapped in his glory, which means Jesus is wrapped in a layer of God's goodness. There's a story, and we fear this, that there's, the Jews believed that if you looked on the face of God, it would kill you. And it was really well depicted in the movie Raider of the Lost Ark, where they open up the ark at the end, and everybody's face melts off, the glory, and they're like, oh, it's beautiful, and then they melt. And we all, and that's what causes us to fear. We're like, there's something about God that we can't stand next to. It's God's goodness. In Exodus, there's a story in Exodus where Moses goes to God and he says, I would like to see your glory. Show me your glory. And God says, okay, I will allow my goodness 
to pass before you. See, God's glory is God's goodness. That's why it's good news. And so he takes Moses and he puts him in the cleft of a rock, and he kind of goes behind him and lets him experience his goodness. Because here's the thing. God is not out to kill us and melt our faces off. God is so good. His glory is so good that when you put God's glory next to our sinfulness, we can't handle it. It would stop our hearts. The overwhelming difference between God's goodness and our sinfulness, that's just the reality of it. But God is good. So God's glory is, in God's own words, my goodness. It's his goodness. So we don't need to be afraid of the glory of God because the glory of God is good. The second thing we're told by this angel is the glory of God brings joy. Have you ever thought about what joy means? I looked it up again. I'm going to get you some words to learn today. A welling up of pleasure, delight, and satisfaction. Think about what that looks like in your life. Do you have a picture of that in your mind? Let me give you my picture of that. Uh, a few years ago when I only had two grandkids, Emery and Spencer, their dad, Andre, went on a six-month deployment to the Middle East. And when he came home, they went and met him at the airport, and my daughter video, or she, you know, she recorded it. And there's a, and Emery, we call her Tigger, because when, she's the oldest. When Emery gets excited, she just bounces. She, she's about, like she's got spring, she just bounces. She gets so joyful and so excited. And she's bouncing, bouncing, bouncing. And all of a sudden, they see their dad, and they just go running down the hall to their dad. And both of them launch themselves at their dad. And the giggles, they're giggling and laughing, and Andre's giggling, and I hear Jesse with the camera, she's giggling. The joy of that moment of being together and having missed one another and just loving each other. I watched that video, I've watched it so many times. It brings me so much joy. It's delight. That's joy. That's what the goodness of God and the glory of God brings joy. It's great news of great joy. But it's a different kind of joy. In this Greek translation, there's a, there's a word uh, kara, K-H-A-R-A, that's attached to that, which is the root word for charismatic, and it means gifted. It's joy that is given to us. It's the favor of God that we've talked about. That's the blessing. It's a gift of joy. So imagine that you have that delight and that splendor and that excitement, but it's gifted to you. And see, this is where we get confused. We forget that God's glory wrapped Jesus up and Jesus was a gift. Isaiah 9, 6, unto you a child is born. That's what we read this morning. Unto you a son is given. That verse we all know, God, John 3, 16, God lo so loved the world that he gave. He gifted. He favored the world. He blessed the world with his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we forget the next verse because he did, the son did not come to condemn the world but to save the world. See, God's goodness God's glory is not to melt us or to condemn us but to free us to bring us back into the right relationship with him Jesus said I've come so you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free and so that joy is a gift and it's not going to put us in prison it's freedom we don't have to fight we don't have to try anymore God can guide us and he's declared us good and loves us even if we mess up. That's God's gift to us, wrapped in his glory, in his goodness, and his favor, and it brings joy. Angel gives us another piece of good news here. He says, I love these words, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Glory to God in the highest. When God is in the highest, in your life when God is first love the Lord your God with all your heart soul body and mind when you surrender to that and God is first the glory of God invades that and that brings peace and do you understand what peace means peace means an end to strife and animosity and hostility see there is a natural strife and animosity and hostility in our own relationship with God because God is so good, and we are sinful and selfish and want to go our own way and defiant, and so there's this constant tension. 
But God gifted us Jesus to come out of heaven and live as a human being and suffer and die on the cross to give us the gift of peace in our relationship with God, to declare us right and good and justified. I love that. Joy to the world. God and sinners reconciled through Jesus Christ. That's the gift of God. And that brings us peace in that relationship with God. And that peace in our relationship with God gives us peace of mind because I don't have to try so hard anymore. I don't have to try so hard to be good and to be perfect and to prove myself worthy of anybody's love because God so loved me that he sent his only son. God so loved you that he sent his only son who was willing to live and die on the cross for you. You don't have to prove that you're lovable. You don't have to prove that you're good. You don't have to get the approval of anybody else because God has declared you good, loving, righteous. And you don't have to worry about the future because God said, I've got your future already taken care of. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Well, my friends, I will read the words of Romans 8, Romans 8 to you over and over. I hope you get sick of them. I hope you memorize them. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God, from the goodness of God. You don't need to fear God's glory because it is for you in a way that overcomes everything and guarantees your future. The good news of God's glory is that it brings God's goodness and great joy and peace. Did you notice something else in this passage, though? The glory of God is infectious. You know, we worry about this COVID and all these things, and I, I know Sam's wearing a mask, a lot of people are wearing masks, and we, we you know, if you get sick, stay away because we don't want that infection. This infection we want. The glory of God is 100% infectious. And when you get around it, it will get on you. And it is catching, and it will change you. When Moses went on the mountain and came face to face with God, they said he came down and his face was different. His whole countenance was different. The glory of God shone out of him. See, when you have an encounter with God, God's glory starts to change you from the inside out. This is what Paul tells us in Romans 5. We will be transformed into the likeness of God, into the likeness of Jesus, and we will be transformed into the glory of God. And it'll start to show in your life and my life. And that's contagious because the minute we start, that first of all pulls us deeper into relationship. Remember that uh, woman at the well that Jesus talked to and then she couldn't wait to go tell everybody. She shared it. That glory started to show. These shepherds were like, man, we got to go see this thing. And so they did. They just were compelled. Something drew them. And along the way, they told people the story. And they were amazed because that glory, that goodness was starting to show. My friends, God wants to use you. God wants to transform you. God wants to be glorified through you. But that means don't be afraid of his glory because in it comes joy and peace and in it God can use us. I want to share with you a real quick story. When I was, we used to take kids to Young Life Camp all the time. Um, Young Life is an outreach ministry to high school kids. And so, for those that don't know it, and, that, and so the kids that go to that most of the time are unchurched kids. That's who we try to go, kids that don't know Jesus, kids that don't go to church. And so as a result, a lot of times we would take kids to camp that were very broken, hurting kids. A lot of substance abuse, a, a lot of physical abuse in their families, just a lot of just hurt and anger. And, you know, when you have young people who are hurting and that are angry, uh, they oftentimes, you want to talk about chips on a shoulder? They are constant, there's a lot of just... Um, animosity, a lot of tension, a, a lot of showing off and trying to be cool and worrying. And, and, you know, it's just interesting. And so we would take these kids on the bus and they would be kind of a mess. And, and they would be not the nicest kids all the time. And, uh, and, and if they were the nicest kids, they were oftentimes uh, being nice because there was just a brokenness inside of them. 
And they would get to Young Life Camp, and the whole idea of Young Life Camp was for them to experience the, the kingdom of God on earth. So from the minute they got off the bus, it's, first of all, in the most incredibly beautiful places, like Asheville, North Carolina, just incredible, beautiful places uh, where you would see God's, the beauty of God's creation. And they would get off the bus, and immediately people would do for them, take their bags to their, to their uh their cabin and it looked beautiful it was crisp and clean there was an overabundance of food and joy and fun and the joy would start and as the joy started and you'd see these kids start to just really have fun you'd see the layers start to peel away the transformation began and then there would become peace in their hearts and minds and now they're not trying so hard to be cool they're too busy I'm gonna dress goofy and I don't care I'm going to have a good time. I'm not going to worry. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go hug my young life leader, and I don't care what, if somebody thinks that's not cool because that person is loving me and being kind to me. The transformation in these kids. And at the end of the week, overwhelmingly, many of them gave their lives to Christ. It was probably the, the stay, say so where people just stand up and say, you know, there'll be five, 600 kids stand up and give their lives to Christ at the end of the week. It's the most overwhelming thing. But to watch these kids then come home and the transformation in those kids and then to watch that be confect uh, infectious to their families. Uh, the Zitt family, who some of you may know, they, they were members of this church for a long time. Their daughter went to Young Life Camp, transformed that whole family. And then they ended up being missionaries and on campus staff with Campus Crusade. And we just saw so much of it transform their whole families and transform their schools. That's the glory of God. It's good news of great joy. And when God is in the highest, there is peace. And that's contagious. And the world will see it in us. And the world will migrate to it. The good news, the world needs it. Let's share it. My friends, this Christmas and no matter what happens in 2023, may you experience and bask in the glory of God. May you experience the joy of the good news. May you just put him in the highest place in your heart and mind this season and next year and, and let his peace reign in you and then carry that out into the world and bring the world great news, good news of great joy. Let's pray. Holy God, I thank you so much for the gift of Jesus. But more than anything, Lord, I, I thank you that you wrapped that gift in your glory, in your goodness. Help us to surrender to that and then bring us the joy and the peace and then send us out to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.